Fix? Yep. Did they fix it or did they have to replace it? I figured they see it. I got your thing. I can't believe you get five or three bucks. Perfect. 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 Morning. Morning. How are you doing? Did they say what you what they thought you were going to know? Please do it now. Oh, just look up your things. Just ask you to glorify this house this morning. I'll ask you to just flood this place, Lord. I love you and worship you. I don't know where our hearts. 
do the, the other announcements and you all can pull it on or give me some kind of cue when it's up, all right? Um, so uh, announcements this morning, June 2nd is the Sunday School Picnic. There's a sign-up sheet in the back for um, things that we need. We also need some help with some setup, some cleanup, uh, organizing some games. And then you can see Bunny if you have questions about that. So we're gonna do that like we did last year um, where there will not be Sunday school that day, but we'll come in at 10 and we'll have service at five and we'll have um, the picnic um, following that, okay? Um, next on um, the 20th, that, uh, Monday, tomorrow, there's a deacons meeting, but we've moved those deacons meetings um, to seven o'clock and um, no one ever told me what the bulletin, so they are at, at seven, uh, so that's a misprint there. Um, on the 22nd, which is Wednesday, I need the names of the graduates. So if someone is um, someone is graduating um, in, in your family, if you could just let me know. And I see people pointing at me, so there she is. There's Rachel Irene, so congratulations to the doing good though and everyone is um, adjusting to hearing a crying baby right yeah <laughs> all right all right and then um, the next announcement can you put up that next slide if you have it all right so um, like Pastor Sean said next week or, or last week um, we're planning a trip to sight and sound and that'll be in November of this year and so if you are interested in going to that, we just are trying to gauge how many people might be interested in going to that. Um, so if you might be interested, if you could just drop your name on the sheet in the back, that doesn't obligate you to go, but it lets us know whether or not there's enough interest um, to rent a bus uh, to, to go to that, all right? And uh, the show there is The Miracle of Christmas. And um, we're, We've done a little bit of a look around. Uh, we're guessing that the cost will be between $150 and $200 a person. It'll be a two day and one night trip. Uh, we'll be overnight in the hotel, so that will be included. The ticket will be included, um, but of course you'll be responsible for, for meals and, and such. We might cover one meal with that. It kind of just depends on how, um, how it all pans out. But if you might be interested, uh, just sign up in the back there in the, in the foyer. Um, Mega Sports Camp meeting will be uh, Wednesday at six o'clock, so if you're interested in helping with the planning of that, um, you can come out on Wednesday for those meetings. And then on Friday, June 7th, there will be a worship night here at seven o'clock. And if you have questions about that, you can see Pastor AJ. And um, one more thing about graduates, we are celebrating graduates the Sunday after Father's Day. Um, and what we do for our graduates is we get them a Bible um, printed with their name on it, and it takes us a couple weeks to get those in, which is why we need those, uh, the names of those graduates uh, a little early so that we can get those ordered and, uh, and make sure they're all correct before, um, before we celebrate them there, okay? And then um, lastly, not in your bulletin, but I'm sure it will be next week, on um, Monday, June 3rd, we are doing team leader training uh, here um, at seven o'clock. So if you are the um, a, a team leader, I think Pastor Sean has already contacted you, but we will be having uh, that meeting on Monday, June 3rd. So you can go ahead and mark that on your calendar. And then um, we're gonna turn it over to Dean if you wanna give us an update. Yeah, uh, Super Bowl, they had a, something called a PET scan this week, and uh, we just want to thank God that it, it came back clean. She's cancer free, so.
our ushers would come forward to receive tithes and offerings. And when you're ready to give, you can stand. And just as a, a reminder, I know a lot of you are giving on, online, um, but there is a link on, on our website for that, also a link to our, our Facebook page if that's more convenient. Before we train in the position of uh, praise and worship, I wanted to, to make a couple more announcements. Um, uh, our, our praise and worship team, after uh, months and months, and I mean months and months, like God, like since I got here in August, um, after months and months of prayerful consideration, our worship team finally has a name, and um, there's there's a really deep uh, message tied into this that I, that I briefly would like to to share with you all. How many know that there's power in your words? There's power in your name. Things that you identify yourself with. No, just me. Okay. Um, well, it's true in, in, in scripture, all through scripture, and, and you know, God, God puts a lot of heavy value on people's names, and and obviously, uh, it's, it's it's no no secret that uh, that there's there's power in your words, and the, your your words, so your tongue is sharper than a wet sword, right? So it's very important, uh, at least uh, to to me and, and this worship team, to have an identity that is. That is solid. That is that is sincere, and that accurately represents you know what we want to be uh, on this platform and anywhere that we go outside of here. Um, so, uh, what was it like? Uh, so sometime last week, uh, I was praying, and God said, uh, said AJ, um, I, I want you to 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 look into uh, the word sacrifice, and I was like, okay. So I did. And I asked Pastor Sean if he, if he knew what the, uh, the translation of a sacrifice was uh, in, in, in Scripture off the top of his head. You know, we really didn't, we, we knew that there was lots of, of different transla translations, but there wasn't really a whole lot um, you know, there to, uh, off the top of our heads. So, you know, we dug into a little bit. And um, I, I, I didn't count them, but there's a lot of different translations to the word, sac the word sacrifice uh, in, in, in Scripture. And that's just the, the, the Greek, let alone uh, the Hebrew um, but Romans 12, 1, uh, and you heard me uh, preach out of, uh, out of Romans uh, a few weeks ago, um, and, well, maybe it was, uh, it was about some months ago, actually, that, that, that message was preached. But anyway, um, you heard me preach out of Romans 12, 1, and if, if, you, if you're familiar with Romans 12, 1, it says to present your body as a living sacrifice, and that is your, your true and proper worship, right? And then it goes on to say to not be conformed by the patterns of this world. 
uh, and, and things of that nature. So anyway, that, that word uh, living sacrifice, I, I was intrigued by that. So I dug into it a little bit more. And, um, the the, the, the he, Greek translation to um, sacrifice and living sacrifice is the word thusia. And um, what this word means is, is this word thusia is the, the noun, the, the, or the verb uh, of the sacrifice, right? So the sacrifice or the, the process of sacrificing, right? So the verb and the noun, right? It can be either. It derives from a word that I believe is pronounced thuo. And what that word literally means, this is where it really starts to get important, uh, especially in, in our identity uh, as a worship team. Um, that word thuo, um, which is birth, this, this word thusia, um, literally means to kill or to slay via fire. And um, that, that via fire part is, is, is just so, is so important uh, in, in, in grasping the idea of presenting your body as a living sacrifice. You hear a preacher in the pulpit week after week after week to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And right here in, in Romans 12.1, uh, Paul is literally saying, hey, present yourselves as a living sacrifice to, to offer yourself up to be slain by fire. How many of you know that fire does not come to really do a whole lot of good, but it destroys things? You can't prepare things that are burned completely, right? Anybody get more, pick up on what down here? Yeah. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We are, our, our earthly, our selfish ways should literally be burned up by the fire of God, which is the Holy Spirit, right? That's a true and proper worship. The word thusia is that sacrifice. And you've heard, you've heard me say time and time and time and time and time again that we're really not a band. We're not performers up here. We're, we're a worship team. And we are, we're, our function is to lead whichever body, whether it's this body or um, when we go to Hampton Christian or when we go to other churches and things of that nature, whatever body uh, is to lead them worship and to, to be examples of worship. So that's what I'm, I'm really pouring into this worship team and that's what I'm hoping to, to pour into you all as well. You present your bodies as a living sacrifice and I hope that brings new light to what it really means to worship God in a very deep way. Um, so without further ado, I introduce Thucia to you. <laughs> Anyway, that's 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 that much of, of, of my announcement. I want to move forward all back a little bit. I just want to go to the next picture of, um, yeah, well, that'll, that'll cover it, I guess. Um, I have a flyer now for the praise and worship night, and it's not. Um, but anyway, this is kind of what it looks like. I just want to briefly, for thirty seconds, um, talk about Friday, June seventh, seven p.m. Um, here, uh, we're gonna have our second uh, worship night since I've been here. Uh, we'll call it come together. Uh, I really want to unite our, our churches in our area. I want us to come together to worship God experience God in a very real way. Um, we Obviously, we're going to be here. We have uh, Christopher Hardy um, from We Are Praise is going to be here. He is an amazing worship leader, very anointed, awesome dude. Uh, you won't want to miss him. And we have another great group, uh, Abundant Hope, will be with us as well. They're coming all the way from Carolina. So um, they're, they're dedicated and very serious about their worship, and they are excited to be here with us. So we have three awesome groups uh, that I'm, I'm really, really excited to, to be a part of uh, and to host and um, trust me, if, if you were here for the last worship night, and I know there are a handful of people here that were, you don't want to miss this at all. The uh, first worship night we had here, we, we, we packed the house, and there were several salvations, a lot of testimonies of healings and deliverances. And it was just a powerful, powerful service. Not by anything that we did, but just because the, 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 the attitude and the atmosphere of the worshipers in this, in, in this room, this very sanctuary, was just so raw. And, this, and the, the Spirit of God was able to flow so freely in this place, and it was amazing. So you don't want to miss that. It's going to be an awesome night. And that is the last of my commercial break. So if you want to, want to stand, we're going to enter into praise and worship this morning. And um, Pastor, if you have two bottles, maybe I'll snatch one home if you want to stand. <laughs> but, um, anywho, I'll give me a minute here to get settled in here. Father, we just uh, we just lift up 
our hands, God, and we just we just worship you this morning, Lord. You're you're so great, you're so awesome, you're so marvelous, Lord. We we praise you for the testimonies of the the for the Farleys and for the Masrols this week. Just such great news coming out of this church. Yes, Lord. Help us to not forget these times, Lord. Jesus, we worship you, we love you, we thank you. We just offer up this time to you, God. Flow our hearts, Lord. And clear us up here for the next 20 minutes or so. And then going into the message, Lord, that you would just speak into us in a very real way through the words spoke this morning. We praise you, we honor you, we glorify you in Jesus' precious name.
in his appointed time. Because you don't know all the pieces that need to be in place when you get there. And when we rush ahead of God, the other pieces aren't in place. You know, God is doing things all over the world to orchestrate what needs to happen in your life. But that's the truth of it. And you're going to run into somebody down the road that God moved to just the right place for just the time that you were there, for such a time as this. And you need to be obedient, you need to say yes, Lord, and you need to allow him to do what he's trying to do with your life. Every one of us has a call on our life. Every one of us. Every one of us has a ministry that we're supposed to be doing. Giftings that are given by God. And those giftings are to complete the body and to move the gospel forward. It's in our hands. And we have to be obedient and do what he calls us to do. And the first thing you have to do is hear his voice. Hear his voice. And know that it's him. My sheep hear my voice and they obey him. They know it's him. They know he's speaking. And the way you do that is you spend time in prayer with him. You spend time in praise and worship with him. And time in fellowship with him. How many of us, when our wife calls and as soon as we hear their voice, we know who's on the phone? Or our husband calls and as soon as we hear their voice, we know who's talking to us? Or even a good friend? Or your mom or dad? You don't need to look at the caller ID. You know their voice. And it's supposed to be that way with God. You're supposed to know his voice. And you should be responding when he's speaking to you. Amen. Amen.
give him a great shot this morning. God, Amen. Amen. Well, I want to I want to thank everybody who pitched in the last week and helped out. Wayne, who took uh, took my Wednesday night class, and, and and everybody else who helped out. So then Pastor Terry and I and AJ, whoever took probably probably uh, who took your class Wednesday. Oh, the new spirit? Yeah, David. David. David for taking AJ's class so we can have a, a little family getaway, family time at the beach. We had a good time and we got refreshed and relaxed and rested and we are excited about everything God is doing. And actually it was perfect timing because we just had that league conference and there was a ton of information given to us and it gave us an opportunity to kind of digest it, go over it, and pray and see God about it. And we are excited about everything going on here. In, in the direction God is leading the church. So um, we're happy to, to um, have the privilege of pastoring this church and, and, and leading it. And as long as God gives us that privilege and allows us to be here, um, we are going to move it in the direction that he wants it to go. So um, we're having our leadership meetings coming up here. And if you are a team leader, you need to be at that meeting. Um, and we are going to be going over some, some, some not really changes, just some, some emphasis we're putting on ministry coming down the road. We're, we're just going to start emphasizing some things a little heavier than we have in the past. So it's going to be exciting. Uh, and I'm sure you guys are going to engage and, and enjoy it and do an awesome job. Um, God is moving here. It's obvious from the healings. It's obvious from from the the things that are going on in the individuals' lives that are that are regular attendees here. Uh, God is doing something. He's doing a work here. And as long as we stay obedient and stay focused on Him, He will bring that work through to completion. To completion. We don't want to miss Him because He ain't missing. It. God's not missing. It. Amen. Mom. So let's get on with, with our series we're on. Uh, we are on the Back to the Garden series. And, and what, what will eternity be like? And uh, we're winding down. We have two more parts left. This week we're talking about what is heaven like now. Let me get my, there we go. What is heaven like now? Um, I, I, I told you guys when we started the series, heaven changes based on the covenant. And the way heaven is, is directly related to the covenant we are in. We're in the age of grace right now, the New Testament or the New Covenant. And in the age of grace, we will spend our time, if we pass here on this earth, we will spend our time in the presence of God the Father and the Son. That's new. It didn't used to be that way. I went over that last week when we talked, or two weeks ago when we talked about Abraham's bosom. And what it was like under the old, okay? So under the new, we go immediately into the presence of God. Because our sin has been paid for. See, prior to that, the sin of man had not been paid for yet. But now our sin has been atoned for, and we are made righteous in God's eyes through the blood of Jesus. You cannot stand before a holy God in sin. And prior to this, everybody was still in sin because the atonement hadn't been made. Until he died on the cross and was risen on the third day, atonement for the sins of the world had not been made. So man could not enter into the presence of God and, and be with him. Even Moses on the mountain only saw the back of God. And look at what it did to him. It made him made his face glow and he was white when he came off the mountain. His hair, his whole demeanor changed just looking at the back of God. Not even seeing him face to face. Now we can see him face to face because of the blood of Jesus. So now when we go to heaven, it's a little bit different than it used to be. And in eternity, it's going to be different than it is now. So let's talk about right now. And we're going to start with just a little bit of statistics on heaven, because y'all know I'm a statistics guy, all right? And explaining what heaven is right now. The word heaven appears in the Bible in just the New Testament 276 times. In just the New Testament. 
It appears in the Old Testament 327 times. So that's a total of 603 times the word heaven or heaven is talked about. So do you think God wants you to know what heaven's going to be like? Absolutely. He spends an awful lot of time in his word talking about it. He doesn't want us wandering around wondering if there is a heaven or what it's going to be like when we get there. He speaks a lot about it in his word. So he wants us to be aware of it. Now, in the Word of God, there are three levels to heaven, according to Scripture. And this is important that we understand this. There are three levels to heaven. The first heaven is the sky or firmament. And it's talked about in Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Genesis 1, 6 through 8. It was created on the second day. On the second day. On the first day, God created the light and, and it came out of the darkness. That's the first day. Then on the second day, he set the expanse in place. This is our atmosphere, basically. It is the atmosphere. And God called the expanse heaven, it says in verse 8. So this is the first heaven, or sometimes it's called the lower heaven. And what it is, is from the surface of the earth to till you get to outer space, our atmosphere. And this is the lower heaven or the first heaven. So when you hear the word heaven on earth, it is heaven on earth because the scripture says it's heaven on earth. So we are in a level of heaven right now and we need to understand that, all right? So this is the lower heaven and it's very clearly laid out that way. The second heaven is space, the stars, and the planets. Psalms 33, 6, Job 9, 8. This was created on the third day. And it says on the third day, God created the, the, the greater light to roll over the day and the lesser light to roll over the night. That's the sun and the moon. And he breathed out all the stars and placed them in place. And this is the heavenly realm of space. All right, that's the second heaven. Um, Psalms 33, 6 says, by his word, the Lord, um, by his word, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them were breathed out of his mouth. So it says in Psalms that God not only made the heavens, he breathed the stars out. You think about that for a moment, the awesome power of a star. Our sun is just a little puny star compared to some of the other stars. And the energy and power that's in the star is amazing. And yet God breathed that out of his mouth. He breathed them out. He knows them all. He named them all. And he placed them all out in existence. So those stars are there because he placed them there, and there's a reason for it. There's a reason why we look up at the night sky, we see all these stars shining back on the earth. And here's an interesting about, thing about the stars. See, science tells us that the stars the light we see was traveling for hundreds of billions of years, right? Who's heard that? That from the distant stars, that light's been traveling for hundreds of billions of years. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says he placed the stars out and the light immediately shined on the earth. Immediately. It didn't take hundreds of billions of years. It immediately shined on the earth. And then in the book of Job, it says he drew the heavens out and expanded them outwardly. And the universe is expanding. According to Big Bang Theory, it should be contracted. But it isn't. It's expanding because the Word of God says it's expanding. All right? So this is just some interesting things about the stars in the second heaven. And the second heaven is there for a reason. And the reason is the third heaven. The third heaven is the dwelling place of God. We're going to look at John 14, 2, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, and Revelation 6, 14. John 14, 2 says, in my Father's house there are many rooms. We talked about this a few weeks ago, all right? God, Jesus went there and he is preparing a place for you in his Father's house, in the third heaven. So when we go to heaven and we die, we are literally in the dwelling place of God. We are in his presence now. And this is the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 is one of the most interesting scriptures in the Bible, all right? This is Paul talking and he's talking about his ailment, his thorn in the flesh, and what's going on. And in the middle of the discussion, he makes this comment that he himself 
was transported to the third heaven 14 years earlier. And if you study out what happened 14 years earlier is the road to Damascus when Paul had his conversion. So in the depiction of that conversion, we know that there's bright lights and there's noise and only Paul sees certain things. Everybody heard, but only Paul saw. That's because Paul was taken to the third heaven. He was literally taken to the presence of God, to Jesus, in heaven. He was taken there, and that's where his Damascus conversion occurred. And Paul lays this out in 2 Corinthians 12, too. It's an amazing, amazing story to what really happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. And then Revelation 6, 14. It says that the second heaven will be rolled up like a scroll, and man will look on the third of third heaven, the throne of God. And this is at the end of the tribulation. At the very end of the tribulation, the heaven we see is a veil. It's a veil. It's there to hide us from looking directly on the face of God. Because we are in a sin state, and we cannot look at the throne of God in a sin state. And heaven is going to be rolled back, and God is going to look directly at the face of man. And this will happen at the end of the tribulation. And that's the third heaven where his throne is. So there are three levels to heaven you need to understand that. All right? Now, let's take a look at what American theology, view, American theological views are about heaven. All right? America as a whole, 67% of the people believe in heaven. So about two-thirds. Two-thirds of Americans believe heaven is a real place. The problem is one-third doesn't. So one-third of the people you run into have no hope at all. They don't know where they're going. They don't know God. And they don't believe heaven is a real place. They're hopeless. And they need you to bring hope. That's a third of the people in this country. America is now the third largest unreached people group in the world. Third largest. The mission field's right here, guys. And you're the missionaries. And we're supposed to be bringing hope to a lost and dying world. So a third of the people have no hope at all, all right? And then of the two-thirds who do, 45% say there are many ways to heaven. So almost half of them have it wrong because there's only one way, Jesus. He's the only way. So a large portion of them believe there's more than one way. So when you really break this statistic down, two-thirds of the people in America have a bad view or a bad skewed opinion of heaven or what heaven is or if heaven even exists. Two thirds. The harvest field is right, guys. People don't know and they're wanting to know. And it's up to you to bring them the truth. Now, six out of ten Americans say hell is a real place. <laughs> Problem is, none of them think they're going. <laughs> so six out of ten is pretty high. And they believe in hell, but none of them, if you ask them if they're going there, they'll tell you no. Few might be honest, but the majority tell you no. So they believe hell is a real place, so when you're talking about hell, they know it's for real. So you have an opportunity to share the truth. Now here's a statistic that kind of shocked me. In the evangelical church, that's us. We're an evangelical church. Full gospel church. In the evangelical church, 90% of the people believe in heaven. That means 10% in the church don't even believe in heaven. I don't understand that. In a Pentecostal evangelical church, 10% of the people don't even believe in heaven. I don't know why they're sitting there, all right? So not that heaven's the only reason, but guys, it's a big part of it. So statistics are amazing. 19% of that 90%, 19% believe there are multiple ways to heaven. So they don't believe Jesus is the only way. So when you break that down, a third of the people in an evangelical church got it wrong and don't understand what salvation is all about and don't understand what heaven is all about. A third. That's a huge number, guys. Huge number. This is why I'm spending so much time teaching on this. Most people's view of heaven is not biblical. It's formed by movies, it's formed by people's opinions. It's formed by books that have been written about heaven that really got nothing to do with the Word of God. And people come up with these ideas of what heaven and hell is like, 
And it's far from what the Word of God says. And we need to know, because when you start talking to somebody about Jesus, one of the first questions I always get asked is, do you really believe in heaven? What do you think it's like? That's one of the first things people ask me. And I, you got to have an answer, guys. That's apologetics. you got to be able to defend the faith. Or they'll ask me, do you really believe in hell? And do you really think that God, a loving God, would punish people forever? you got to know the answer to that question, guys. And what's the answer? Yeah. Who's punishing them? They're punishing themselves. They're punishing themselves. God gave them every opportunity, right? God provided a way. He, we're in the age of grace. There's no excuse. There's no excuse to go to hell in this age. Amen. God has given them every opportunity. All they got to do is lay hold of it. And if you go to hell, you choose to go to hell. You choose to serve the flesh and the sinful nature instead of serving God. It's that simple. It doesn't take any works. All you got to do is believe. He couldn't make it any easier. Now, religion's made the gospel complicated. But God made it very easy. All you got to do is believe. Word of God says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Sorry, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. All you got to do is believe. And if you believe in him in the resurrection, you will be saved. And we've made it very easy. God's made it very easy. But man through religions made it very hard. He said, no, that's not good enough. You got to do this other stuff. You got to do all this other stuff. And it negates grace. His grace is given and poured out on us. And works negates grace. It's a free gift from God. All you got to do is lay hold of it. It doesn't take works. But religion makes works part of the package. All we got to do is bring the truth and bring grace. And tell people how easy it is to be born again. To have a relationship with him. And to get to go to heaven. So those are just a few interesting statistics before we jump in to what heaven's like today. First thing you got to understand about heaven today is there's a place there for you. It's already been prepared. God has made this place for you to dwell with him. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is Jesus speaking. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you I go there to prepare a place for you? He's already prepared the place for you. All you got to do is lay hold of it. And he's telling us here not to worry about it. We are in the new covenant, the age of grace, and it is available for you. When we go to heaven, we will be in the presence of the Father and see him sitting on his throne with Jesus at his right hand. We will stand right before our heavenly Father, and we will see him. Abraham's bosom is empty now. Everybody else is up there. Everybody is up there. And it is a place that is going to be awesome better than we could ever imagine. This is the third heaven, and this is where we now go when we die. We enter into the presence of God in the third heaven. Verse 3, And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. There's a place for you, and he wants everyone to be there. Everyone. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't sleep. You don't lay in the grave. You don't wait to see Jesus. You're there immediately. He's prepared a place. And when you go, you go and be with him. Verse 4. You know the way to the place where I am going. So what's the way to the place where he's going? Verse 1 tells us. If you believe in God and believe also in me, all you have to do is believe. And if you believe, you will go to the place where he was go, he's going. All salvation is through belief in him. Faith. All salvation. Have faith in God and believe in Jesus. And then there's two proofs. I already talked about this. You know if you're going because he speaks to you, you hear his voice and you obey. 
and you'll change. You become Christ-like. If he's not speaking to you and you're not changing, you better check yourself. Because you don't want to be the one that stands before him and say, Lord, Lord, I went to church every Sunday. And he says, depart from me, for I knew you not. See, that's the key. He needs to know you. Knowing him isn't good enough. He needs to know you. And if he knows you, he's in relationship with you. So you have to have that kind of relationship with him. <clears throat> so where are we going when we go to the third heaven? We're going to the city of the living God. This is what scripture calls it. The city of the living God. And he gives us a description of it in Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So this is the name of the city. It is the heavenly Jerusalem. And in the end, in the end, end when we get to eternity, this city is going to come down here on earth. It's going to come down here on earth. We'll talk about that more next week. But right now, it's in heaven. And this is God's city in heaven. And he tells us what's there. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. So when you get to this city, there's going to be angels everywhere. We are going to be dwelling with these angels and interacting with these angels and living with these angels. So not only are the people who died before going to be there, also all these angels are going to be there. And you're going to interact with them on a regular basis, all right? Thousands and thousands of them. Verse 23, to the church of the firstborn whose name is written in heaven. The church of the firstborn is a name for those gathered together as a body of believers, all right? It is the body of Christ. So this is the corporate body of Christ is going to be there. Every believer. From Adam all the way to the last person to die before Christ comes back. will be there in the presence of God. Corporately as a church. Alright? So the church is not just us in these four walls. It's the entire body of Christ. It's every believer. Every denomination. It's all of us gathered together in unity. And we are all going to be there as one body. Alright? And then it says, you have come to God the judge of all. Remember I told you, you're going to stand and be judged. You are going to stand before him and be judged. The first judgment is the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody stands before Christ for the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody. So everybody who dies is going to see heaven. Everybody who dies is going to see heaven. And you will immediately be judged. I remember the first funeral I ever did. It was a funeral for someone who was not a very nice person. And I had serious doubts they went to heaven. And I remember talking to, to a mentor pastor friend of mine, who Pastor Kerry and I were raised up under, and I asked him, what do I say? Because everybody's going to ask me, do you think this person's in heaven? And he looks at me and goes, you have to tell them, I know he's seen heaven. I know he's seen it. I know he's been in the presence of God. And I know if he could come back, he'd tell you, you don't want to miss it. And all those statements are true. They come right from here. Everybody will stand and see. Everybody will look and be amazed. And then you will be judged by Christ. And those who are condemned and sent to hell, they're going to know what they missed. They're going to know what they missed. And that's probably the saddest thing of all. In the judgment. They will have seen. I'm going to show you another scripture about that in a moment. So everybody will be judged at the great white throne. Or sorry, the judgment seat of Christ. The second judgment is the great white throne of judgment. That is not for us as believers. That's not for us. That's for the resurrection of the dead. The second resurrection. Those who are in hell. Who will be raised up in the end. And they will stand before Christ. And they will be judged by the other bulls. The Word of God talks about the other books that will be opened, the books of secrets, <clears throat> all these other records that were kept about your life. And then you will have to give an account for that, and then you will be cast into the lake of fire. There's no second chance. But you will have to stand before Christ and give an account for everything that you did in your life. And then you're cast into the lake of fire. But that's not for believers. Believers don't go through that judgment. That's only for unbelievers. All right? So you, so he is the God 
that judges all. And then the next, to the spirit of the righteous made perfect. This is us as individuals. So God is talking about when you're in heaven, when you're in my city, you're going to see corporately the church, everybody. But then you will also be there individually as an individual. And you'll run into other individuals that you know. And you will recognize them. All right? You will be made righteous not by what you did, but by, by what Jesus did. By what Jesus did. So you will be there as an individual, and we will see each other individually and know each other individually. Then verse 24. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, there is one mediator, Jesus Christ. That's it. Doesn't say to Buddha. Doesn't say to Muhammad. Doesn't say to Confucius. Doesn't say to anyone else. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, there is one way. And the only way is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you don't lay hold of him, you're not going to hell. You're not. You must lay hold of him. He is the mediator. He will be there. This last part's very interesting. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. A lot of people read that and go, what's he talking about? Does blood speak? Yes, your blood speaks. Your blood speaks. How do we know this? Because when God came down to Cain after he had killed Abel, and he said, Cain, where is your brother? And, and, and Cain said, I'm not my brother's keeper. The response God had was his blood is crying out from the ground. His blood cries out for vengeance. You see, that's what this is talking about. Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Jesus' blood cries out for purification and atonement. It is a better blood. His blood makes you righteous. His blood speaks a better thing. It speaks atonement and purification. And the blood of Jesus is in heaven. It's in heaven. And it is speaking a better thing than Abel's blood. That's a powerful statement, guys. Jesus' blood cries out for atonement. It's crying out for the lost. It wants them to know who he is. And it's speaking it for them. And we have to help people to lay hold of that blood so that they can be made holy and righteous. So these are the things that we will see in the city of the living God. These are the things we'll see in heaven. Another thing about heaven. It'll be a place of unity. Welcome to the next slide. It'll be a place of unity. And this is Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues. All nations, tribes, people, and tongues. Heaven is a very diverse place. There are all different kinds of people there. And they are all of one race. Christian. Christian. Christ came to do away with Jew and Gentile, that's race. Free and slave, that's socioeconomic class. Male or female. He came away to do with all the things that divide. And we will be in unity in heaven as one race, Christian, the church. And we have to understand that because the church is supposed to look like heaven. It doesn't, but it's supposed to look like heaven. It's supposed to be just as diverse as this scripture. It's supposed to have, have people of all race, all class, all gender, all age. And it's supposed to be a very diverse looking body that reflects heaven to the world. Instead, the church in America is the most segregated time of the week. Sunday morning is the most segregated time of the week. And it isn't supposed to be that. Church is supposed to reflect to the world what heaven looks like. It's supposed to be an all-inclusive place where everyone is welcome and everyone is loved because God is love. And we need to do a better job of reflecting the kingdom of heaven to this world so it will draw it in, so it will draw the world in. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, 
So like I said, you'll see the throne of God with God sitting on it and the Lamb, Jesus, seated at his right hand side. Clothed with white robes. Let's stop here for just a moment because I want to talk about this. I get asked this question, and I think it's funny, but people ask it to me. When we go to heaven, are we going to be naked? Because Adam and Eve were naked. And, and, and this picture is drawn from, from Hollywood that when we get raptured, all of our clothes are going to be sitting there in the seat, right? Isn't that what you see? How do you know when someone's raptured? Their clothes are still sitting there, right? That's what Hollywood says, right? It doesn't say that in the Bible, guys. It doesn't say that in the Bible. When we get raptured, I don't know if our clothes will be there or not. I really don't, because it doesn't say. I do know this. I'm going to have a robe of righteousness, a white robe that's going to be put on me. The scripture is very clear about that. So guys, don't worry. We won't be running around naked, all right? <laughs> we'll have clothes on in heaven. We'll be wearing these robes of righteousness. Now, eternity, I can't give you any promises about eternity, all right? Because that's a reset back to the garden. So that's a whole other thing. I don't know about that, all right? But right now, when you go to heaven, you'll have a robe on, all right? For some of us, that's a good thing, okay? So you, you'll stand in the presence of God with this robe on. All right, let's talk about why people think for just a moment that when you're raptured, all your clothes get left behind. There's a couple reasons, okay? The first reason is because when Jesus was resurrected, what happened? His grave clothes got left behind, right? But they weren't his regular clothes, they were his grave clothes, all right? And then something different about Jesus and you, when you get taken, your spirit's going to go to heaven. Jesus got his resurrected body. You will not have your resurrected body. So Jesus had a body. And when Jesus showed up, was he clothed? Or was he running around naked? He was clothed, right? He was clothed. All right? So Jesus had a resurrected body. He was clothed in the grave clothes or what was left in the grave. But for some reason, another Hollywood's taken that. And he's taken this scripture. It's Jesus' description of what will happen when he comes back. And it's in Matthew 24, 40 through 41. And it says the two men will be working in the field. One will be taken and one will still be there, right? And two women will be grinding wheat. One will be taken, the other will still be there, all right? So they get this depiction that your body's going to just disappear and be gone. And that all that's going to be left is your clothes. But see, it doesn't say here their clothes is left. It just says they're taken. Now, it doesn't even give a really good description of what happens when you're taken. Now, I have some thoughts about that. This is not a thus saith the Lord, but it's very clear in other places in the scripture that this goes back into the ground. This goes back into the earth. And your spirit is what gets taken. So, so I mean, you could biblically make an argument that when we get raptured, our spirits are taken out of our bodies and our bodies just fall on the ground dead. Because they're going to go back into the earth. They're going to go back into the earth. This is not who you are. Your spirit is who you are. All right? So your spirit is what gets taken. I don't really know what happens to your body. It doesn't say. Maybe your body's taken, so there's not a bunch of bodies laying around. I don't know. God can do anything. But I will tell you this. The Bible doesn't tell you. So anything you see depicted on TV or in a movie, that's just man's depiction of what he thinks. It's not a thus say for all. Most people think it is, all right? So your body will be, we, or your spirit will be taken, and you will enter into the kingdom of heaven, and you will have this white robe on, so you won't be naked, all right? With palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is the real Palm Sunday, guys. This is the real Palm Sunday, where we're finally going to get it, and we're going to be waving our palms, and Jesus is not going to be weeping. He's not going to be weeping. Remember on Palm Sunday, I told you, Jesus was brought to tears by what happened on Palm Sunday. It wasn't right what was going on. When we go to heaven, and, and we see him, and we worship him, we will be holding palm branches and waving them, worshiping. It's not the only thing we'll do, but we will do that, all right? So... It's going to be a place of unity. It's going to be a diverse place. There's going to be all kinds of people there from all over the world. All right? Here's a bonus for you. I threw this one in just to, because I thought you'd like it. All right? 
we will see the Ark of the Covenant. Because the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven, guys. It's not in a tomb buried somewhere. It's not in a warehouse on Area 51 like Raiders of the Lost Ark showed. It's not something that's here on this earth. But yet people are still looking for it all over the place. And all you got to do is open your Bible because your Bible tells you where it's at. It very clearly states where it's at. The Ark of the Covenant is in the throne room of God right now. It's in heaven. This is Revelation 7, 9 and 10. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there was lightnings and noises and thunders and earthquakes and great hell. We will see the Ark of the Covenant in the throne room of God. It's sitting there. How did it get there? When the present, when the Spirit of the Lord left the temple before Babylon conquered uh, the Jews, all right, and Nebuchadnezzar carried them off. When Babylon came in and conquered the Jews, Nebuchadnezzar inventoried everything that was in the temple and wrote it all down. There's a very accurate, detailed description of what he carried off in the Word of God, and the ark wasn't there. But if we go to um, Ezekiel, Ezekiel tells us before Nebuchadnezzar conquered the city of Jerusalem and took the temple, the presence of the Lord left. If you want to read something amazing, read that, because Ezekiel saw, saw the presence of God rise up out of the temple with a throne and all this other stuff. <clears throat> there were these wheels with eyes on them that looked all over and could see everything. And this thing, which was the presence of God that was in the, in the very midst of the nation of Israel, left with the ark. Left with the ark. And is now in heaven. It will come back when Jesus comes back and sits on his throne in the temple. Which will happen at the end of the tribulation. So when Christ comes back to rule and reign for the millennial reign, the ark will come back. But right now it's in heaven, and you'll get to see it in heaven. What else is in heaven? When you go there, you'll be in spirit form. In spirit forms. It is your spirit that goes to heaven. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. So when you die, this, the dust, your body, it's just temporary, guys. It's an earth suit. And when you die, it's going to go back into the earth where it came from. And your spirit will go to heaven. You are a spirit. That is the eternal part of your being. You have a soul, which is your mind, will, and emotion. And you have an earthly body. Those things are going to pass away. They're going to pass away. I believe your soul will pass away after your sin consciousness is taken away when you enter eternity. Because it's very clear in the millennial reign, people, people are still sinning. And people still have a sin conscience. And it's very clear when you go to heaven, from the story of Lazarus to the rich man, you're going to have your memories of this earth and what went on on this earth and the people that you knew. I think when we go into, into, into eternity and we're given... Um, a, a, an eternal existence, I think that's a reset, and at that point in time, you will no longer have the conscience that you have right now, the mind that you have right now. Everything is going to change, all right? That's what I believe. I tell you right now, the Word of God doesn't say anything about anything. There's very little about eternity. Very little. All right? But it does say it's a reset back to the garden in the way it was in the garden. And in the garden, there was no sin consciousness. There was no sin consciousness. So when we get to eternity, we're not going to have a sin consciousness or a sin nature. Okay? So we won't be able to sin. What a great day that's going to be, isn't it? Amen. Amen. All right? So the Bible does not say exactly what you will look like in heaven. However, it does say that you will have a spirit body. And the spirit body is the same form is a flesh body. It has hands, it has feet, it has a head. It's, you're not going to be a bunch of ghosts floating around or some light. You know, sometimes you see it as a light that glows. Uh -uh. You're going to have the form of a body. We are created in the image and likeness of God. God is a spirit and he has a body. It talks about his feet. The earth is his footstool, right? It talks about the hand of God. 
Did the, you know, Abraham looked at the back of the head of God. Or sorry, Moses did look at the back of the head of God. God walked through the bowl that was split in half with Abraham. He has legs and a feet. So he has a body the way we have a body that is a spirit body. And when you get to heaven, you will have this spirit body. And that will, will sustain you while you are in heaven until you get your resurrected, glorified body. All right? Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54 talks about this in great detail. It says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This cannot go into the kingdom of God. It's very clear, all right? Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. That's because this is flawed. It's broken now. It's perishable. It dies. And this cannot inherit the imperishable, which is eternity, where you will live forever. It's not capable. Listen, and I will tell you a mystery. Anytime your Bible says, listen, and I'll tell you a mystery, you better pay attention. <laughs> all right? Some of the versions say, listen, and I'll tell you a secret. All right? You better pay attention. Paul's getting ready to hit you with some real revelation here. All right? We will not all sleep. Remember I told you this word sleep here. When Paul talks about sleep, it's sleeping from your work. What is your work while you're here on earth? Winning the loss. All right, that's the task God has given you as a born again believer. And we will rest or sleep from our work. All right, but Paul tells us right here, not all will sleep. Why is that? Because we know some people are going to go through the tribulation. They're going to be marked by the Holy Spirit. And they're going to go all the way to the end of the tribulation. There will be a group of people who live through the tribulation that are believers. And they will go all the way to the end of it and be alive when Christ comes back. They will be alive when Christ comes back. But they're going to be changed before he occupies this earth. And this is what the scripture is saying. All right? But we all will be changed. Everyone must put on the imperishable when we enter into that age. Everyone. All right? Now, what about all of you who have been taught there are going to be people alive on the earth that will make the transition into the millennial reign and there will be physical people here on the earth during the millennial reign? The Word of God does not say that anymore. As a matter of fact, it says the exact opposite. Zephaniah 1.18 says, No one, no one will survive the day of the Lord's breath. No one. No one means no one. He is going to wipe out everyone on the face of the earth. Those who have the mark are going to be transformed instantaneously. In the twinkling of an eye, the word of God says, they're going to be changed from perishable to imperishable. But they have to be changed because they can't enter in unless they're changed. So there will be no people, human beings in this form, that make the transition. We'll talk more about that next week, guys. But the, Zebaniah is very clear. The, the, you need to go look that up. It's 118. You need to read it because the description, no one is going to survive the day of the Lord's wrath. No one. So that day is coming. It's coming at the end of the tribulation. All right? So no one will survive that. But the people who are here and are marked by the Holy Spirit, who did not take the mark of the beast, will be transformed instantaneously. And that's what this scripture is saying. In flesh, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the last trumpet is right before Christ comes back. Right before he comes back, the trumpet's going to sound and he's going to come riding in on his horse with his robe dripping in blood and all the saints are going to be behind him and all we're doing is watching and he's going to speak a word and that's going to be the end. That's going to be the end. Right when that happens, at the last trumpet, the believers that are here are going to be changed. They're going to be caught up into the sky with them, and they're going to be changed immediately into the imperishable and receive their resurrected bodies. All right? For the trumpet sounds that the dead will be rise, raised imperishable. That's us who are already there. If we're already there, we're going to come back. Before our life ends, we'll be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortal. Then the perishable will be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortal. Then the saying that was written will come true. 
Death has been swallowed up with victory. This is when God defeats his final enemy, death. Because there will be no more death. There will be no more death. Now there's some debate on exactly when that part happens. But that part is going to happen. There will be no more death. And God will have final victory over his last two enemies. Satan and death. Death is real, guys. It's an enemy of God. And he's going to have victory over it. All right? Another thing about heaven. We're going to be learning. I've talked a little bit about this. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now I see in the mirror dimly, but then I will see face to face. When is this then? When is this then? When Paul gets to heaven. That's what he's talking about here. When I get to heaven, I'm going to see face to face. Now I see in part, then I shall see fully, even as I am fully known. In other words, he's going to stand in the presence of Christ and be taught by Christ. And just like everybody there who he's teaching knows him fully, they know who Paul is, they know everything about him, and everything that he knows, he's going to know about Jesus and who Jesus is and everything that Jesus knows. He's going to learn in heaven. All right? And then another one, Ephesians 6, or Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, Paul says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm of Christ Jesus. In order that in this coming age, what age? The next age that's coming, the millennial reign. All right? The next age that's coming. So in order that in this coming age he might show the incomparable the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. He's going to show us what real grace is. Guys, we think we know what grace is. When we're standing in his presence, we're going to know what grace is. We're going to understand what grace really is. All right? Now, this word show here is strong 1731, and it means to openly display so that no one can miss it, to demonstrate something as undeniable. Undeniable. Jesus is going to show us what grace is really all about, face to face. And we're going to understand how deep his love is, how wide his love is. We are going to finally grasp who God is. And that's going to be awesome. But it's going to be taught to us who he is. We're going to learn. All right? And then this is just a bonus. Even the angels are learning. This is revealed in 1 Peter 1.12. When he's talking about salvation and grace and what it is and why Jesus died on the cross and why everything had to happen. He says at the very end of that, that passage, he says, even the angels long to look into these things. They're learning and they're trying to figure out what God's master plan is and what's going on. So even the angels in heaven are learning. We will learn. You're not just going to have it downloaded to you. We will learn. So what's heaven going to be like? We will feast and celebrate there. We will feast and celebrate there. All right? Revelations 19, 9. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. God is preparing a banquet for us there. And we are going to sit at this table and feast with the Lord when he brings his bride home, all right? His bride will come home in the rapture. When he calls his church home, that table is going to be filled with the last of the people who are supposed to be seated at it. And we are going to have this feast in heaven. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this is something I've been driving since I've gotten here. There's room at this table for everyone. There is room at this table for everyone. You have to understand that. Everyone is invited. Jesus tells us that in Matthew 22, 1 through 22, in the parable of the wedding feast. Everyone is invited. In the parable of the wedding feast, the king first invited the people who were part of his kingdom, and they rejected him. That's the Jews. He invited the Jews first, and the Jews rejected him. And then he sent the servants out and told them to invite anybody who will come. Anybody, that's us, the Gentiles. And they went out and invited anybody, even the poor beggars, anybody who wanted to come, because there's room at the Lord's table for everyone. 
And then there's a very interesting verse at the very end of the story. The king walks out and gets ready to sit at his table. And he looks at the one person and he says, how did you get in here without your wedding clothes? And people ask me all the time what that means. What is his wedding clothes that is missing? The righteousness of Christ. He got in and he wasn't wearing his robe. The robe I just told you about. The white spotless robe. The robe that Christ gives us. His righteousness. Do you think that robe's white because of what you did? It's spotless because of what he did. And somebody gets into the wedding feast who's not wearing the robe of righteousness. They're not born again. And the king throws them out because they have no place at the table. All you got to do is be born again and you got a place at the table. There's people out there who think they're going to sneak in and get a seat at the table. And they don't know. And he definitely doesn't know that. He definitely doesn't know that. You must be clothed in his righteousness to have a seat at the table. But this is a seat for everyone. And all you got to do is believe. And you're clothed in his righteousness. It's great. It's a free gift from God. All right? There's a warning in Luke 13, 38, 28 through 30 for those who think they're going to sneak in. Listen to this warning. This warning is for the religious rulers and the Pharisees of Jesus' day, but it's just as applicable today to the religious leaders and Pharisees of today. There's plenty of them out there. He says, there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are thrown out. Just like the person who didn't have the right wedding clothes on and was thrown out, there's people that are going to try to enter the kingdom of heaven. They're going to see it all. Just like I told you guys, they're going to see, sit at that judgment seat of Christ. And he is going to look at them and judge them on whether or not they accepted him as Lord and Savior. And they're going to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets. They're going to see the kingdom of heaven. And they're going to see what they're missing. And he's going to say, depart from me for I knew you know. Depart from me for I knew you love. All right? People, people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. Indeed, these are those who are last, who are, are last, and the, uh, those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. So, this table is going to be filled up, and here's the interesting thing about the table. Who's sitting at the prominent seats? The least. The least. Because Christ came to be a servant. And if you're a servant, you're going to give your seat up for the least. You're not going to sit by God. He's going to be at the head of the table. Christ is going to be at the head as the bridegroom. But you're not going to take that seat at the right or the left. If you're a true servant, you're going to take the seat down at the end of the table. And you're going to give that up for the least. Because that's what the Word of God says. We are to have a servant heart all the way until we get to heaven. And we're going to have the same heart he has. And we're going to give those seats up for the least. All right? So, this feast is going to happen in heaven, and we are going to eat in heaven. But we also know there's other food in heaven, right? We know man is angels' food, right? Isn't that what the Israelites were taught? It was the food of angels. So they're eating something in heaven. Now, I don't know why you got to eat something in a spirit body. I don't know, but God may have uh, manna for them, and they ate it in heaven. So they're eating in heaven, and they're eating in spirit form. All right? Um, Jesus ate in his resurrected body, right? When he came back to the earth, he ate. He sat down with the disciples and he had food and he ate and enjoyed a meal. So that he ate in his resurrected body, right? God is a God of festivals and celebrations. Guys, you have to understand this. God likes to throw a party. And when we get to heaven, there's going to be a party. I'm telling you that. The Jews have over seven feasts and festivals that are celebrated, and some of them are as much as a week long. And they celebrate things God did for them, all right? We're going to celebrate at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to have this feast when we get to heaven. But we're supposed to be celebrating right now. It's called communion. And it's supposed to be done whenever you eat. Whenever you gather together and eat, you're supposed to be doing communion as a reminder. 
And it's a celebration of what's to come. What's to come. It's not supposed to be a ritualistic thing we do the first Sunday of every month. The church has fallen into that through religion. When you have dinner at home, you're supposed to be having communion with your family. And you're supposed to be feasting and enjoying that with your family. So God is a God of celebrations. And when we get to heaven, we're going to celebrate and we're going to eat. We're going to eat. Somebody said to me, I, I'm not too sure about that. And I said, why not? And they said, I don't know. You're in spirit form. Why are you going to need to eat? And I said to them, well, why do you say all the time they're dining with the Lord and seating at the feet of Jesus tonight? They're having dinner with the Lord when somebody dies. Why do we say that? Because God is a God of celebration, guys. And we are going to be celebrating in heaven. It is going to be a festival and a feast, all right? So it is definitely going to be that way. Last one. Last one. This is the most important. It will be greater than you could ever imagine in the flesh or soul, your mind, will, or emotion. The Word of God says that. You will not be able to conceive it or understand it in your flesh. But in the spirit, you can. In the spirit, you can. This is exciting. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love. That's you. That's you. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human mind can conceive. It is inconceivable what heaven is going to be like. It's inconceivable in the flesh what heaven is going to be like. But listen to what he says in verse 10. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deeper things of God. Guys, this is why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so important. It's a lot more than getting to speak in tongues. It's a lot more than having a prayer meeting. It's a lot more than miracles and signs and wonders and being able to perform them. It's a lot more than words of wisdom and words of knowledge. The Spirit is the key to bringing this alive, Amen. to changing it from a written word to a rhema word, to bring it alive so that we can understand what God is revealing to us in it. The Spirit is the key for us to grasp the deeper things of God. He wants you to know them and show them to you. But it can only happen in the Spirit. And if you really take the time to sit and pray and seek God and ponder what heaven's going to be like, he'll reveal it. Because he's revealed glimpses of it to me. And it's amazing. It's amazing. I think about it all the time. You know, we, we, we know that through the fruit of the Spirit and through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we can kind of grasp some of these things. But then we also have some biblical texts. We know that Jesus in his resurrected, glorified body just walked right through walls, right? He wasn't bound by the things of this earth. He didn't have to go up the stairs and come through the door. He just walked right through the wall and showed up. We know also that he was transported from place to place. When he was walking with the disciples on the road and he sat and had dinner with them, the very next moment he was in the, in the room with the disciples talking to the rest of them. That same night. And it was like miles and miles apart, a distance he could have never traveled or covered. And the next thing you know, he's in Galilee. He just moved around wherever he wanted to go. And I talk to people all the time about, we're going back to the garden and we're going to live in an agricultural society. The Word of God is very clear about this. And they look at me and they go, so how are we going to get around? We're not going to have trains. We're not going to have planes. We're not going to have automobiles. When we go to Jerusalem to worship him, how are we going to get there? Same way Jesus got there. We're going to say, I want to be in Jerusalem, and we're going to be in Jerusalem. Just like that. Because we're going to be on God's agenda, doing things the way God wanted us to do when Adam and Eve were first in the garden. And we're going to have the ability to do that. I want you to think about something for just a moment. 
We use 10% of our brain. What's the other 90% there for? God didn't make it for no reason at all. He didn't make a mistake when he made it. There's a function to it and a reason for it. It's not being used now, but that doesn't mean it isn't going to be used later. For whatever reason, we don't have access to those parts of the brain now that enable Jesus to do these things. And that's what I believe has been revealed to me. When I went through all my mess with my head and, and had my shot installed, one of the things they did was they put the, my shot through the right side of my brain. Stuck it right through my brain. It's a big plastic tube. It goes, stuck it right through my brain. All right? And Pastor Kerry goes, well, why are you putting it on the right side? Isn't it going to hurt some? And the doctor said, well, he's right-handed, so his motor skills are on the left side, and we don't want to stick it through the left side, because then he'll mess up his motor skills. And she goes, well, what's it messing up on the right side? He says, well, we don't really know that. <laughs> but that's the side we're putting it through, because we'll do less damage there. That's a little scary thought, but that's the truth of our brain. And he put it through the right side, and I did have some issues. I have some memory issues. <laughs> All right? And I have problems with names and, and remembering things that I never had before. So he messed up some wiring when he stuck it through there. But the amazing thing was he goes to me, you know, we really don't understand what the brain does. He goes, I got stroke patients. Some of them have a stroke and it attacks the side of their brain that does motor skills and they can't walk, they can't talk, they can't, they're all crippled up. And we know people that's happened to, right? And he says, and for some unknown reason, some of them, We'll switch sides of the brain and all that will fix itself. And they'll be able to, it's like they never had a stroke. And they can switch and use the other side of their brain. And some never recover. And we have no idea why. And if you think about that, you think about the power of your mind. The doctors know your mind can heal. Your thoughts have power. Your words have power. What you think matters. And we're just using 10% of our brain. What's going to happen when we can use all of it? So think about that, because when you get to heaven, you're going to be using all of it. I'm sure. Think about what we'll be able to do. And guys, ponder the deeper things of heaven. Ask him. Spend time praying in the spirit. Ask him what it's going to be like and he's going to reveal it to you. Not just heaven, the temporary place you're going. Eternity. Eternity. That's a very, very long time. And the Word of God is very clear. He wants you to know what is, what is waiting for you. He wants you to know what is waiting for you. But you can only know it through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. It will reveal to you. He will reveal to you. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you the deeper things of God. What is waiting for you in eternity. Amen. Lord, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for just an opportunity to get a glimpse of what awaits us, Lord. Help us to be excited about that. Help us to be excited about what's going to happen when we get to heaven and when we stand in your presence. Help us to be able to tell people about what we've learned about what heaven's really like, Lord. Help us to be prepared to defend the faith. Help us to understand these deeper truths. Lord, give us revelation as we think about this during the course of the week. And we pray and we seek you, Lord. Open our minds and give us revelation about what heaven is like. What it is going to be like to be in your presence, Lord. What it's going to be like in eternity, Lord. Help us to grasp those deeper truths as your word says. Help the spirit to reveal and search the things out that we need to know. And help us to be in your presence in everything we do. Lord, I just pray you give us an ear to hear and a heart to receive you during the course of this week. And Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness to go share our faith with someone. Boldness to go tell somebody about who you are. Boldness to be about your work and about increasing the kingdom of heaven. Help us to tell somebody what's going on in our lives and how good you are. And help us to lead them to you. We know the fields are ripe. Help us to be a harvester. Help us to harvest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
When did you get in? Um, That's awesome. Okay. All right, good. Yeah, it's kind of not the best time to travel, but at least you're not going through like DC and five. Right. So, yeah. I guess you guys don't go through there anyway. So. Thank you. 
right? Yeah. I mean, how many times do you want to hear before you accept it? Before I can pack up. For me, it's thousands and thousands of times. Yeah. Right. And in my head, you know, God has me at the point where I submit it to him and say, yes, Lord. So it's kind of a tricky thing. But, but as far as the Jews go, they're not like being abused. They're not telling that. The truth of the word. And does that mean God doesn't love them? If he loves them, he loves them enough to give Jesus for them. Even after they rejected him, he's still there for them. That's the only reason we got it, because they rejected him. But see, here's the truth of Judaism. And this is something people miss. Judaism was not meant to be exclusive. They were not exclusive. It was meant to be inclusive. Anybody could become a Jew. And if you read the beginnings of Judaism in the early years, you know, you saw Rahab, the prostitute became a Jew. She was brought on in Christ. If you look at Ruth and, and Naomi's daughter, she was a Jewish, she became a Jew. And she's in the bloodline of Christ. So there were many, many people who became a Jew because Israel was supposed to be a model for the world how to have a relationship with God. And you were supposed to be a nation of priests. Sounds like the church is supposed to be a model for the world. We're supposed to have a relationship with God. We are a nation of priests. We're just not being priests. I mean, you know, the church is a church. It's the experience of membership and that's the thing. You just get blessed. It's just like you're not. You say something like so many evangelicals don't. Can you believe that? No. And this is from my point, which is a which is an evangelical Pentecostal survey. How does it happen? I mean, just it, when I read stuff, and it's accurate numbers. The Lifeway survey is hundreds of thousands. What did that say? That only what percent? Ninety percent believe in heaven. So ten percent don't believe in heaven. And of that nine months, twenty percent of them believe there were multiple ways to heaven. And they're sitting in the evangelical. I mean, heaven looks like it's impossible, but I mean, it's hot out there. But you know, one of the things that, that shocked me, you know, when we started, no, I'm going to try again. We were in a good Bible teaching church, and the next church we went to, we went right to was a good Bible teaching church. And the third church was a good Bible church. And we thought all the churches taught the word of God. We just thought that. And then, as I became a pastor, we started fellowshipping with other people in the assembly, other pastors. They don't all teach the word of God. Some of them are very shallow and they know one message. And the one message is the problem is them, not us. And that's not what the word of God says. And the message is, they're just all a bunch of heathens, and they need to come in and be born again, and hell and brimstone and all that. And that's not the problem. The problem is we're not being that much. We're not investing in them. We're not forming relationships with them. And we're not helping them to understand what the issue is. And we're not coming the right to speak to them. You got to have a purpose in life. What's in the Bible? Love is all these Caring is all these <laughs> investing in your neighbor, helping them. Oh, yeah. You know, going to the marketplace, talking to people about Jesus and Jesus. That's the best thing. It's not build a building and swing open the doors and say, we're here, you all are up to you, and you need to be in here. The, the, the model of the church was to take the message of death. Where did Jesus spend all his time? The sick and the sinners, drunk. Um, I'm going to see that because they're leaving soon and don't forget to look at the graduation thing. And that starts at 12. Okay? Yeah, so it's just a little different way to look at things. And I know that's a tough thing on the Jews. And in fact, just a few years, you can YouTube it. Uh, I think it was Pat Robinson who asked that question specifically. Uh -huh. And he gave the right answer. I mean, he got based to even from the church board. And, and I'm positive it was Pat Roberts who gave him. He basically said, God loves the Jews. He gave them away. I'm sorry, they're going to hell. And, and man, the church came, everybody came against him for that. And all he did was told him the, the truth. truth. He was asked it in an interview. And you could tell the question was a setup, too. That's the bad thing. Right. 
But they was asking in an interview, and he goes, you mean to tell me all the Jews in Jerusalem are going to hell? And he goes, if they're not Messianic ones, they are. <laughs> and everybody got upset. But that's the truth of the word, you know? The law ain't going to get them there. They don't even do animal sacrifices anymore. So what's covering their sin? <laughs> Yeah. They gave up animal sacrifices when the temple was destroyed. What's covering your sin? Wow. Study that. Study that. Yeah. They think that they.